So first of all, today's class is in honor of the upcoming yard site of the father of one of our regulars of this class, one of the pillars of this class. Um, and he was a great student of Tanya and of the subjects that we connect to over here in this class. Tzvi Daiv Ben Yeshua Menachem Mendel Herschel Halevi. Right. And uh, he should have much nachas from uh, the learning that his daughter does here. And uh, we're very privileged to be part of it, to create this, this environment, this group, where we're able to, to learn deep stuff. And it uh, should be a schos for him. Okay, and there's food out here. You can make brachas. I'm going to make a bracha on my coffee. Okay, so this is the last class before Pesach break. And... We're going to do, not, we're not going to do Tanya today, we're going to do uh, Eclipse, yeah. our Eclipse curriculum. Now, I just want to tell you something. I've known about this Eclipse for a long time. In fact, um, you know, these Eclipses, they can be calculated hundreds, if not thousands of years in advance. So it's not a surprise to anybody. The earthquake on Friday was a surprise. That I did not... <laughs> I only was I was only informed about the earthquake about an hour before it happened. But I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. But the the eclipse we've know yeah the eclipse you know that those these, those things can be calculated astronomically. Uh, and you know, I just want to tell you my little meta um, behind the scenes rabbinic internal dialogue or monologue as it were. I was like, should I do an eclipse thing? And I'm like, no. That's what all those pandering rabbis do in order to be relevant. I don't need to talk about an eclipse to be relevant. Torah is eternal. Right? No, no. I, 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 honestly, in the very end, I was like, okay, the eclipse is in a few hours. Let's just do it. Yeah. Right, okay. You can't even copy you this time. The Rebbe posted it, by the way. Not the Rebbe posted it. Okay. The Rebbe spoke about the eclipse. I just posted it. Okay, so don't t don't give away my share. I'm not. Okay. I didn't even listen to it yet. I didn't have a chance. Okay, good. All right, it's Baruch Hashem. All right, fine. So before we get into the eclipse, everything is Hashgacha Pratis. Everything is by divine providence. There's another astronomical event, which is a very common one. It's not one that really people get excited about, but it is one as Jews that we're aware of, and that uh, that's coming up, uh, which is Rish Chodesh, the new moon. And specifically, <coughs> the new moon of the month of Nisan, which historically was the first new moon that was observed as a mitzvah by the Jewish people before they even left Egypt. HaChodesh Hazel Lachem. This month, meaning the month of redemption of Exodus, should be for you the first month. I'm saying the exodus from Egypt, but sure, exodus from the current exile as well, 100%. Okay, so Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses gets the command back in Egypt before they even leave that this month is the beginning of the calendar. <clears throat> and that sets up the Jewish calendar. Um, there's, however, another aspect of astronomical calculations as far as the calendar aside from the new moon, and that is the solar cycle. And I'm not going to get into really technical astronomy here, but just very, very, very simple. Um, a, a true lunar month, you know those Gregorian months are completely arbitrary, there's nothing, the, the secular months like <coughs> January, February, March, April, May, has nothing to do with any lunar phases or anything. Okay. Um, a true lunar month, which are the months that we use in the Jewish calendar, is 29 and a fraction days. So you multiply that by 12, um, you get 355 days. I'm going to just round off. Uh, is that right? What? What? Let's just use whole numbers, yeah. What? What's 29 times uh, 12? I'm going to have a calculator. Everyone has a calculator. Everyone has a calculator and a GPS and a camera. 
348. It's 348. Yeah, but you, you then put in the fractions. Do 29 and a half times 12. 29.5 times 12. 354. Okay. So. <clears throat> The solar year is 365, and it's not even 365, 365 and a quarter, and that's why the Gregorian calendar has leap years every four years, right? All right. So you have, a, you have okay, oh, a different type of leap year. Yeah, we're going to speak about that. Okay, so there's a discrepancy between the, what I'll call the lunar year, which is kind of a misnomer because it's not really a year, but... Um, a lunar year and a solar year of about, I'm going to, these are very, this, I'm, I don't work for NASA, so my calculations are very sloppy here. But let's say about 10 days. Let's say nine in a, in a fraction days, okay? So what happens is, if you'll notice, that a date on the Jewish calendar will creep backward. It'll get earlier and earlier. Um, until finally it gets so early. You mentioned a Jewish leap year, okay? Until finally it'll get so early, we'll say, okay, this is enough, we gotta push things off, and we'll put in an extra other, right? Okay. So that's how you know, okay. So one of the ways that we know that the discrepancy between the lunar and the solar cycles is becoming excessive, unmanageable, is the vernal equinox. By the way, our uh, Muslim cousins do not pay attention to the solar calculation at all, which is why, yeah, Ramadan will creep backward through the year, and it'll sometimes be in the summer, it'll sometimes be in the winter. They don't attempt any reconciliation between the lunar and the solar calendar. So, like the Gregorian calendar, the lunar months are non-existent. It's completely solar. Like a Gregorian calendar, if you know a particular date on that calendar, that date will always be the exact same, in, in terms of the solar cycle, will always be exactly the same. Um, like sunrise will always be at the exact same time uh, every year on April 8th. It doesn't matter what year, in the Gregorian calendar. In, in, in the Muslim calendar, um, it's the opposite. The, 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 the months, the, the lunar cycles are precise, but there's no correspondence between those dates and where we are as far as the solar cycle. Following? Okay, so the Jewish calendar reconciles both the lunar and the solar, and the, the mechanism that we use is by adding an extra month, as we mentioned, Chaydish Adar. Why Chaydish Adar? Why is that the month? Why don't we add any other month? That's the last month of the year, because we mentioned before Nisan is the first month of the year. So the first month of the year, Nisan, if it starts to get too early, we add an extra month, a 13th month beyond the 12th month, which is called other base. But what does too early mean? Well, I told you already, who remembers from four minutes ago when I said one of the ways that we determined that Nissan got too early. What, what did I say? But what, what benchmark did I mention? You guys aren't listening. One of the indicators. You remember? I'm going to say it and you'll be like, oh yeah, you, you did say that. Vernal equinox. Okay. What's the vernal equinox? Okay, what does that mean? Fine. So we have the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox. For that matter, why not? We'll talk about the summer solstice and the winter solstice. The vernal equinox, vernal means spring, uh, equinox means equal night, meaning the night and the day are equal. 12 hours, 12 hours, right down the middle. You know, in the summer, when the sun goes down at like 9 p.m., right? You light Shabbos candles at like 8.40 or something crazy like that. And then the winter, it's like, what? Shabbos candles at 3.52? That's crazy, right? Okay. And then there's the equinox where it's right in the middle. By the way, I was never in Quito, Ecuador, 
But you know why Ecuador is called Ecuador? It's near the equator. It's near the equator. Yeah, they always have sunset, sunrise at like 6 p.m., 6 a.m., 6 p.m., all year round. I was never in Quito, Ecuador, but I was in Caracas, Venezuela. That was the closest I was to like the equator. And it's true, like the, the, the fluctuation of sunrise and sunset is minimal. It's minimal because it's near the equator. When you get up to the extremes, like think about like Alaska, where in the summer you barely have night. The sun barely sets before it comes back up again. And then in the winter... I mean, and, and then, the, and then the, yeah, in the winter, it'll be like uh, you barely have, have day. Okay, at any rate, so there, there's the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox. Autumnal is autumn. Um, those are the two points in the solar cycle when the day and night are equal. And then, of course, you have summer solstice, winter solstice. Summer solstice is the longest day of the year. Winter solstice is the shortest, shortest day of the year. Okay, so... Pesach can never be earlier than the vernal equinox. Right. Uh, I think it's been over a hundred years since Pesach was earlier than March 25th. Um, so if you see Pesach would be before the vernal equinox, you got to push it off by adding an extra month, the 13th month, Chaydish Adar. So a leap year is a nidcha? Well, we don't call it that, but yeah, it pushes, yeah, it does push things off, yeah. Okay. So you're following so far? Okay. Now, there's a verse in the Torah. It's actually in Parsha Surah A, in the book of Dvarim, Deuteronomy, that says, Guard the month of the spring and make a, I'll just, I won't translate it, Pesach for Hashem. Guard the month of the spring and make a Pesach for Hashem. Where is the month of the spring going that it needs guarding? <laughs> it's going into the, yeah, the spring isn't really going into the winter, but what it means is pay attention. Guard here means pay attention, meaning Make sure that Pesach will always be in the spring. How do you know it's spring? Well, there are other... Indi I've said earlier that there's one way that we, that we determine that it's spring. I said the vernal equinox. I was very careful. I said it's one way because there are other ways as well, which I don't want to get into, such as the blossoming of the trees, which is not astronomical, but has to do with... with uh, I guess it's biological. But... One of the main signs that we need to be aware of is the vernal equinox. So guard the month of the spring and make a Pesach for Hashem means make sure that Pesach, pay attention and make sure that Pesach will be after the vernal equinox. And I'm sure a lot of people are stressing right now and be like, oh no, on top of Pesach cleaning, now I have to make sure that Pesach is after the vernal equinox? <laughs> and I don't even know these equations. How am I going to figure this out? I've got amazing news for you. You want to know something? You don't have to do anything. The calendar was already set up 2,000 years ago, and it's, it works pretty well. So just buy a calendar and you'll be good. So I don't want to make, I don't want to mislead anyone to think that they're the ones that we're all waiting. Did you calculate when the vernal equinox is? <laughs> so the calendar is rigged? Like the, the calendar is rigged, yes. So was yeah. it really only 2,000 years ago? A Hillel uh, formula, yeah, yeah. I'm saying the the, 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 I mean the you biblical the calendar, the basic, it's amazing. The the astronomical calculations, yeah. I mean the Rambam talks about all the calculations that are used. Okay. So, here's the thing. As modern people living in a modern world. How often do we think about things like vernal equinox, or autumnal equinox, or summer solstice, or winter solstice, or for that matter, really, even like, when is the new moon? When is the new moon? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. yeah. Tonight. Yeah, tonight, tomorrow, yeah. Now we do know. I didn't say that it's not possible to know. I'm saying that because of the way we live our lives, 
generally, it's not something that is incredibly important to us to the extent that if you would not be an observant Jew, you would have no clue what phase the moon is in. And I will prove that to you. Go to Manhattan and pick any smart person, find a smart person, but I'm saying a smart, educated person who knows what's going on in the world, and stop them and say, excuse me, you don't have to be overly precise. Is the moon waxing or waning right now? <laughs> I promise you, it will take you, you'll have to ask 200 people before you will find someone who even has a clue. Do you think there are that many smart people in New York? No, even if you only ask the smart people, all you're saying you won't even be able to ask 200 people. But we're aware because it's always so... So, so we are aware. We are aware. Well, sh later. well sh Shabbos being early and later has to do with the solar uh, cycle. I'm talking about the lunar cycle. But any of these astronomical things, regular people in 2024 don't need to know this stuff. Look. In the olden days, when people were agrarian, you know, were farmers, or okay, or sailors, right now, where's the Big Dipper? I don't know. I have a GPS. <laughs> where's the North Star? I have, I have ways. I don't need a North Star. I have ways, right? But in the olden days, when people were navigating with the stars, for sure they knew where stuff was. And if they were agrarian, if they were farmers, for sure they knew about the seasons. They knew... No, they knew exactly how to calculate when is spring and when is the reaping and the harvesting and the whatever. This was very important to them. Now, you can walk into the store and you can get ripe avocados 365 days a year. Okay, so we are very disconnected. Well, hold on. We are very disconnected from these cycles, which for... All of human history were really important. This was the rhythm of life. And we have sort of become oblivious to it. And not to mention, even the cycles of, I'm, I've been talking about the solar cycles and the lunar cycles, but also even just the daily cycle, because of electric lights, we got those lights blazing. It's like Las Vegas at our house, 24 hours a day, all day long if you want it. So we are really oblivious. If it wouldn't be for Shabbos candle lighting time, I'm not even sure how much we would think about what time sunset is and its, fluc its fluctuation, right? Yeah. Okay, so my point is we live a life, I say we, modern society, that is really divorced from the natural rhythm of the universe. And you're thinking and saying, do I agree? I want to disagree just for the sake of fun. And I'm saying, no, 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 you don't. You don't. Because... I mean, we're much more inside. We're not working in the field Thank you. That's much. right. It's just so different. And our kids are out there even less. That's true. Kids don't play outside they anymore. Don't play outside. Right. They have their right. Well, Remember, it used to be come home before dark. Right. Right. Well, come home before dark. Everyone's right. lamenting in the summertime right. when kids used to be out all from morning to night. They're staying inside more. Yeah. Okay. okay. Getting dirty is not okay these days. Is there any other quote that says that Pesach cannot be before the um, earlier than the vernal equinox? Because isn't Parsha A much after Rosh Chodesh Nisan? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which Parsha. That's, it's not written at that time because it has nothing to do with what time of the, the year. It has nothing to do with what time of year that Parsha is read. Okay, but okay. is that the sole reference for when we know That's that? That's the, the main verse that is based on. Okay, all right. So, um, yeah. So I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about a little child. There was a little child. He grew up in uh, a country that doesn't exist anymore, but today it would be Iraq. And his father was an idol worshiper, and everyone around him worshipped idols. And he got to thinking. And how did he get to thinking? He looked up in the sky, and he said, look at these massive orbits. 
What is moving them? Abram? Yeah, Avram Avinu. <laughs> Abraham. So he looked up in the sky and he says, look at these massive orbits. There's a power that's moving everything. What is moving it? And he went through this process of deduction until finally he understood that there is a prime mover and there is a single one force that is the force of all, a force of all forces. And he came to believe in the one God. He was very little. Better. Yeah, he was a kid, yeah. yeah. So what's the point? The point is that Abraham's faith began not by pondering philosophical questions like what's the right way to live, what's the meaning of life, how do we define good and evil. It began when he was looking at the sky. He was in awe and he tried to make sense of what he was seeing and he came to a conclusion that there must be one force, one power, and that that is God. So the source of our faith really has to do with a little kid looking up in the sky. Unbelievable. There's a, a chapter of Psalms. We actually say in the Shabbos prayers, every Shabbos, but it's uh, 19, Kapitol Yud Tes. And it says, Hashemai misaprim kveid kale. The heavens relate or convey the honor, the glory of God. What does it mean the heavens relate or convey the glory of God? So Ibn Ezra, who was a great medieval Spanish rabbi, and actually interestingly enough, there's a crater on the moon named after the Ibn Ezra. Yeah, yeah. So some nerd at NASA, obviously, Went to yeshiva and. Mm -hmm. Is that what it's called? Ibn Is it called Ibn Ezra? I forget. You could Google, Google it. It has a weird name. It's not called Ibn Ezra. It's like some anglicized version of Ibn Ezra. But there, yeah, there's a crater on them. Google it. Can I teach the class and you guys be my research department? Okay. Okay. I see these guys on podcast. They have one producer doing this stuff. I have 20 people in a room. Just pull it up for me and let me just continue being smooth. Okay. All right. Just pull it up, please. All right. Eventually we'll get sophisticated enough that we'll be able to have a Bluetooth and we'll put your phones onto a monitor that I'll be able to see and you can pull up verses for me and sources and I'll just read it. It's called Abin Ezra. It's a lunar impact crater. It's a lunar impact crater. In the rugged highlands. In the what section of the moon? In the south central. In the south central. I heard the south central moon. Isn't that where Ice Cube is from? The south central moon? Okay. One person okay. laughed. Okay. Fine. Um, <laughs> all right. So the Ibn Ezra said, there's really a south central moon. When they name the star after you. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> I'll sell you some real estate on the moon. <laughs> I've got a timeshare on the moon. <laughs> okay, so the Ibn Ezra says in his commentary on the Psalms, mm -hmm. what does it mean, Hashemai Mesopotam Kveid Kel, that the heavens relate the praise of God? He says that in order to understand this psalm, this poetry by King David, and how it indeed praises Hashem and relates the glory of God, you have to have a knowledge of astronomy, which he did. And all of the great rabbis of that era, and we mentioned earlier the Rambam, right? You said, how do they know those calculations? I say, it's in the Rambam. You can look in the Rambam, he has all the calculations in Hilchas Kiddush HaKedush. So all of the rabbis in that era, of course, they, they knew astronomy. Ibn Ezra knew astronomy. So basically, here's the thing. Part of basic spiritual literacy as Jews, how do, like, how do you like that term, spiritual literacy? Part of basic spiritual literacy as Jews involves some awareness of astronomy. And, and yet, we are so divorced from that. 
we don't really think about it. So that includes the astronomical signs? The astrological the signs. astrological signs. Yeah, well, that's a related science. It's related science. Interesting, my brother, David, who does the Parsha Rabbit Hole, which I'm sure everybody watches on the Creative Judaism channel on YouTube, he was saying that in medieval times, astronomy was considered a soft science and astrology was considered more of a hard science, and now it's the reverse. Okay, at any rate. Um, So we have this basic idea of astronomy and being aware of astronomy as being foundational to our belief in God. That's how Abraham began his awareness. And that's how um, it's one of the ways in which we become sensitized to God's presence in the world, like, like the Ibn Ezra says, that the glory of God is related through knowledge of these things. And yet, we're so far removed from all this stuff, it, uh, it's a disadvantage. It's a disadvantage for us. It's like a, a void that we have, that we're missing that, that awareness. It makes a person uncentered in a population, in a sense, of hmm. it's how you're not thinking expansively, you're just You're saying not having an awareness of astronomy? Yeah. So, I'm, I have here, I printed it out, actually. This is a transcript of a sicha, of a talk, uh, from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Yem Gimel Parshish Nitzavim. So it's right before Rosh Hashanah. Chav Dalet El. Right before Rosh Hashanah. Tav Nun Aleph. Meaning, it was still 1990. Like late summer 1990, right before Rosh Hashanah. And there was a gathering of women and girls. Sometimes they would clear out the whole 770, get rid of the men, and it would be a talk just for the women. So this was a gathering of women and girls. And like I said, it was the end of the summer. I don't remember the, and I didn't look up the exact secular date. But earlier that summer, there had been a total solar eclipse. Sort of like the one that's supposed to be happening in a few hours. Right? It's a total solar eclipse in a few hours? Not here. Not here? We are. We're going to see 93%. 93 percent? Yeah, okay. that's high. That's pretty good. Okay. No. Okay. I heard 93 percent. People went to Buffalo, meanwhile, it's cloudy. Okay. Yeah. So, in the summer of, so, are we going to get on a train right now? Okay. And are you guys making travel plans right now? Where to go? Or? This is all academic, right? Nobody's going anywhere, right? Well, you're discussing Buffalo and Cloudy. You know. I know, you're right. So then, okay. Okay. <laughs> We're trying to focus. Huh? Okay, you're trying to focus. Right. <laughs> I'm bringing us back. <laughs> ah, thank you. Okay. What did the Rebbe say? That's a great I, question. Yes. Okay. So there was a, um, a total solar eclipse. I don't know what percentage total it was in New York, but there was a total solar eclipse on July 11th, 1991. And at this gathering later on in the summer, the Rebbe spoke about it. I could send this to the class. Meaning it was already after the eclipse. That's why I was like struggling with whether I should speak about the eclipse a week ago or two weeks ago. The Rebbe spoke about it like a month after. So it's okay. Which just shows it's like not Rabbi just. Stealing his speech. What? He didn't want to the Rebbe's speech. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody stole the Rebbe's speeches. That's, uh, it was unavoidable. But I, I'm actually thinking about it, and far be it for me for, to interpret. But I think, I don't know, what, I'm just making this up. But to say an eclipse speech before it happens is like, yeah, anyone can do that. 
But to talk about it after it happens means you actually care about it. <laughs> it means there's some integrity there. Is that why there's no class next week? No <laughs> class next week because people are cleaning for Pesach. It. People are cleaning for Pesach next oh. week. Okay, so this was a month or two after the eclipse. And basically the Rebbe spoke about the eclipse as what we would call today a teachable moment. And remember that I was speaking to women, and he's speaking to girls, and uh, I mean, I'll just read you a part of it. Yeah, so regarding the heavens, meaning the physical heavens, not not shemayim. Sometimes we mean spiritual realms, but meaning the the what do you call it? Space. Shlochayda, who in yin TV shall I write in by in yin shall nas a mephis? What we're talking about here is a natural thing. It's not a miracle. An eclipse is not a miracle. I mean, like I said, we know, <laughs> like we know that these things are coming. If you know how to calculate it, you can know hundreds, thousands of years ahead of time. But as our sages explain, the movements, the orbits of the spheres, the celestial spheres, spheres represents their bowing, so to speak. That's what we say, which is, uh, we say it in davening, but it's a verse from Nehemiah that the heavenly hosts, meaning the, the celestial bodies, bow to Hashem. When they, when they move in their orbits, it's a form of submission to Hashem. And the Rebbe says, and the fact that these things are moving means that there has to be a mover. Like it's related in the Midrashim about the first Jew, Avram Avinu, our father Abraham. And the Rebbe goes on to explain that Avram Avinu did not observe any miraculous event. He simply looked at the movement of the orbits and he got to thinking and thinking and thinking until he came to a conclusion that if there's this massive power that is moving these orbits, then there must, there must be something behind it, that the power must be an expression of something, that movement has to be an expression of a mover, and that's how he came to believe in God. So the Rebbe says like this, the fact that people are looking up in the sky, including little kids, Avram Avinu was a little kid when this happened, the fact that little kids are going to be looking up in the sky and they're observing something that is completely natural and normal. What are you, what are you distracting me about? July 11th was the date of the solar, the total solar. That's what I said. said that. Didn't you just say that July 11th? No, spoke I said the solar eclipse was July 11th, 11, 1991. Right, but didn't you say the Rebbe spoke about it? No, I said that I was spoke about it a month later. A month, a month or two later. Oh, oh, so the, the speech wasn't on July 11th. It was the That's exactly oh, what I said. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. So what were we talking about? Right, the kids. That a little kid looks up in the sky and he notices something that's completely natural and normal, something that you can calculate hundreds and thousands of years in advance. It doesn't matter. See, people want it to be something abnormal, Oh, there's an eclipse. This is so weird. No, it's not weird. But just the fact that you pay attention. How often do we look up? We never look up. We look down. I look up. You look up? Yeah. I like the sky, I like the birds. I, the I sky like and the birds. I'm saying, okay. saying in general, we just take it for granted, whatever is happening. Not anymore. Not anymore. I don't take it for granted. So when, with the exception of Tzipi, <laughs> When a solar eclipse happens, all of a sudden everybody looks up. 
And what's the significance? This is what the Rebbe is saying. Mm -hmm. You don't have to read something miraculous into this. Just the fact that for a moment, all around the world, or at least within, the, what do they call that, the, that belt of visibility or whatever, that there are people looking up. That itself is wonderful. Judaism began because a little kid looked up and said, hey, what's going on? What's going on up there? And in a few hours, there'll be little Jewish kids who are going to be looking up. Hopefully they'll have the little glasses. Yes, they do. Or the shoebox diorama that I made, we made when we were kids. Never worked. We, I made the little shoebox thing with the mirror thing, the periscope. No, but they have special glasses. They have special glasses now. <laughs> and all over the world, you're going to have little kids, just like Abraham was a little kid, and he looked up and started thinking. You're going to have little kids looking up. And here's the thing. When that eclipse happens, I'm trying to remember from the last time I saw one, you actually see movement. Yeah, we saw it. You see movement. In, in, in other words... It's not static. It's a process. I don't remember how long it takes for to converge. I guess it's the, the shadow of the moon covering the sun. But you see it moving. And so cool. you can't not realize that there's movement. Right. And that's the whole point. If there's this massive force at work, this massive power that's creating this movement, there must be a mover. So, yeah, it's very good. It's from the Rebbe. That's why I'm telling it to you. Yeah. The whole concept of a solar eclipse is this moment where all of a sudden we modern people who are so divorced from the rhythm of the universe, we don't think about seasons and equinox and solstice, and we don't think about that stuff, all of a sudden, we look up and we can't help but notice that the universe is moving. It's moving. And if it's moving, there must be a mover. And if that's not a powerful spiritual experience for you, all I can tell you is it was enough for Abraham. That's what got him started. He said, look at this movement. If there's this massive movement, there must be a mover. That's it. But that's the same as the earthquake this week, no? Okay, it's amazing. The earthquake, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You want to talk about the earthquake? The big problem with the earthquake is that it happened on Friday. All the rabbis had to rewrite their sermons. Sure, there's significance. Yes, there's significance. But the message here is much more powerful than that. Yeah, there's Kabbalistic significance. What does the sun represent? What does the moon represent? 100%. And there's specific meaning. What does an eclipse mean? That this is covering that. 100%. Yes. But the message here is much more powerful than any of that. The message here is, you know something? Just the fact that for a minute or a few minutes, we're going to suddenly become aware, we're going to remember that there's this massive power at work all around us, all the time, not just when there's an eclipse, but all the time. That itself is a breakthrough, or it should be a breakthrough for us. And, and the fact that little children, who gets most excited about the eclipse? The little, the little children. Oh, you do, okay. Yeah. That little children are going to be looking up in the sky. And, and the Rebbe is saying this to a, a group of women. This is parenting advice as well. So when you go and you look at the eclipse, again, with the proper eye protection, with your children, this is the teachable moment. This is look, because they will never forget that. Look at the movement. There's, the, the, there's movement here. There's these giant, massive things are moving. What's moving them? The sun rises and sets every day. Yeah, that's exactly my point. And nobody's having a spiritual experience from it. So the fact that the eclipse comes by and makes it interesting for us, the truth is, if we were really spiritually attuned, then every morning we would see the sunrise 
and we'd be blown away and be like, wow, God is at work. Okay, but because uh, we, we don't get excited about it, but at least when there's an eclipse, all of a sudden we shake off that complacency, our jaded complacency, and we, we become sensitized again, and that's an incredible opportunity. And what about every 28 years, Bir Kantakama? How does that tie into this? It doesn't. <laughs> Why? Because we're still marveling at <laughs> Because there's nothing discernible to see. Bir Kantakama, uh, yeah, the blessing on the sun every 28 years, you, you, you would not see anything. There's nothing there to see. The point is... Why do people look up then? You, there's no phenomenon that's out of the ordinary that you would notice that would indicate to you that any, anything is happening. The point is that when there's an eclipse and you're looking up, it is undeniable that this stuff is moving. And I'm not going to get... And don't you dare get into a geocentrism and a heliocentrism because I'm not going there. I don't care what's moving around. I mean, I do, but I'm not, I don't care to discuss what's moving around what. The point is, this stuff is moving. And when you see an eclipse, it's undeniable, this stuff is moving. It's moving. And if it's moving, there must be a mover. And don't forget, that was the beginning of Avram, of Avram Avino's journey. Again, it wasn't a philosophical query. He wasn't pondering the meaning of life. He was simply observing. There's this movement. If there's movement, there must be a mover. And that's what started him. And that's what we're able to experience. And what every little kid who's going to go watch the eclipse can experience with the right coaching, if you make it a teachable moment. All right.